Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Sunday, everybody. For those who celebrate it, Merry Christmas for tomorrow. I hope you're with your friends and your family. For those who do not celebrate Christmas, I hope you're having a good weekend, and I wish you all the best during the holiday season. I'm currently traveling for the holiday season. I'm in a hotel at the moment, so there's a bit of a background noise. I hope it's not too distracting. Initially, I was not going to do an episode today, but there was a lot to cover, and frankly, today's episode is very interesting. This was a lot of fun to put together. It's very concerning, disquieting material, but very interesting nonetheless, and we had to cover it before Christmas, so this episode is going up today. There'll be no episode tomorrow on Christmas. I'm going to take Christmas off. I hope you enjoy this episode. Let's jump in, and let's begin with the housing crisis. This week, Bloomberg Economics published a report looking at the current state of the property crisis in China through several charts. As we move into next year, it's useful to take a look at the situation, to take stock of the situation, and remind ourselves where the crisis is now after already a few painful years. Let's examine the Bloomberg piece, which we will quote parts of with some supplementary commentary. The charts and numbered titles are Bloomberg's. One, trillion dollar sales slump. Nationwide, property sales peaked at 18.2 trillion yuan, 2.5 trillion in 2021. By that time, real estate had become one of China's largest industries, so big that the chairman of China Wang Keqo said that he couldn't find a lucrative alternative business which would allow him to diversify. The following year, apartment and commercial property sales nationwide plummeted by 4.9 trillion yuan, or 27%, the biggest annual slump since 1998. At the current pace, sales will decline 1.8 trillion yuan this year, according to Bloomberg calculations based on official data by the year to date. In 2024, property sales are expected to shrink further, and developers are likely to face more liquidity problems. S&P Global Ratings forecast sales could fall to around 10 trillion yuan in a negative scenario. That would take the sector's activity back to levels seen in 2015, when China's economic output was about half its current size. 2. Broad Spillover the property sector has turned from driving growth to weighing it down, argues Bloomberg. Its output shrank 51 billion yuan in the first three quarters after decreasing 140 billion yuan last year. A smaller real estate sector is widely seen as positive for the economy in the long run, freeing up people and capital for more productive industries. But the short-term shock is painful, as real estate is connected to more than 60 sectors in China. 3. Investment Route the sales route has pushed real estate giants like Country Garden Holdings Co. to default and restrained spending by others. Real estate development investment plunged by 1.47 trillion yuan in 2022, then worsened through the first 11 months of this year. 4. And this is systemically incredibly important. Local governments earn less a subject which will be very familiar to regular viewers. Local governments have earned less from land sales since the slump in the property sector. Such income, which fell 23% in 2022, shrank another 18% in the first 11 months of this year, compared with the same period last year. This was despite China loosening curbs on land sales, restrictions introduced in 2021 to rescue the housing market. Since the 2021 peak, government income from land and property activity has fallen 3.1 trillion yuan when factoring in property related taxes. We will be discussing the local fiscal situation more later in today's video. 5. Developer bonds gone. Developer debts, with their high rewards and extremely rare cases of defaults, were once some of China's most popular bond trades before 2020. Quote, the market is all but dead now. Since 2020, defaults have been picking up pace, reaching 133 billion as of the 11th of December. Offshore investors are swallowing almost all of the losses. End quote. Writes the Bloomberg piece. 6. Market value plunge. Chinese property stocks are still stuck in a downtrend near a 14-year low. As of mid-December, the country's top 10 private real estate builders had collectively lost 1.1 trillion Hong Kong dollars, or 84% of their market value, since early January 2020. 7. Consumption hit. Official data shows existing home prices have dropped 8% since a peak of July 2021. 
Anecdotal evidence suggests even bigger declines in big cities, something which we will explore in greater depth shortly. As we covered earlier this week, a 5% decline in prices can lead to an aggregate loss of 19 trillion yuan in housing wealth, potentially reducing household consumption by at least 430 billion yuan. 8. Mass layoffs. The Bloomberg piece writes that the just-mentioned calculation does not include the impact of job cuts. Quote, meaning the actual impact of the property sector's meltdown on the housing spending may be even greater. End quote. Some of China's biggest private real estate developers cut their headcounts by as much as nearly 80%. 9. Shrinking wealth of tycoons. Chinese real estate moguls once ranked among the country's richest. Not any more. 10. Perhaps of most concern to Beijing, sprawling protests. More than 1,800 demonstrations related to real estate took place in mainland China since June 2022, according to Freedom House's China Descent Monitor Project. About two-thirds of cases involved home buyers protesting issues such as project delays and poor workmanship, while the rest were mostly construction workers demanding pay. Okay, these are the 10 charts. While we're on housing, we've just observed uh, that, according to official data, existing home prices have dropped 8% since a peak of July 2021. However, this week, UK-based The Financial Times reports that house sales in Beijing and other cities are cutting prices aggressively, according to brokers, despite official statistics that show the housing market in the Chinese capital remains buoyant. Interviews with more than two dozen real estate brokers across the capital, writes the outlet, show transaction prices have fallen between 10 and 30 percent from their peak in 2021. This is quite a disparity when compared to what the official numbers tell us. Quote, actual home price falls are bigger than National Bureau of Statistics numbers. Official statistics could make policymakers think the market is doing fine when it is actually in deep trouble. End quote. The piece also argues that Beijing doesn't want third-party data from leading real estate brokers available to the public. In August this year, the outlet explains, property platform Beikou apologized after publishing a report that suggested 12% of completed residential apartments in China's 28 major cities were unoccupied. The platform has since been banned from publishing historic transaction prices. The Financial Times piece gives several anecdotal examples of homes in previously hot neighborhoods being listed without interest, forcing sellers to reduce prices. For example, Jane Wang, an office worker in Beijing, the outlet writes, listed her centrally located two-bedroom apartment for 5.6 million yuan in March. Two months later, she had not received a single inquiry. Wang reduced her asking price to 5.3 million and then 5 million before, quote, in desperation, she relisted the apartment early this month for 4.7 million yuan, lower than the price she paid for it four years ago, end quote. Wang Li, a Beijing-based marketing executive, is waiting for prices to drop before buying a home, reportedly expressing, quote, I don't need the government to tell me everything is fine. It is not, end quote. The government can shut down a protest, as we know too well. However, it is much harder to stop, but it is much more difficult to stop people from refusing to believe that everything is okay. Next up, we move from the housing crisis to the even more dangerous local fiscal crisis. I hope you're enjoying today's episode. If you're getting some value from this episode, I only have one ask. That is to like and subscribe. This is the primary way in which this channel grows. The main way it is shown to new people is if the algorithm is happy. For anyone who wants to help keep the channel financially sustainable, which allows me to continue doing this every day, open and free for all, Patreon and Buy Me A Coffee links are in the description below. My commitment has been a channel open to all that is reliant primarily on subscriber support rather than corporate sponsorship. And with your assistance, I know I can keep it that way. Thank you so much, everybody.
for the ongoing support. Let's continue. Finally, for today, Professors David Daokui Li and Zhang He of the Academic Center for Chinese Research Practice and Thinking at China's prestigious Tsinghua University have recently published a new study making the startling claim that local government debt in China amounted to 90 trillion yuan, 12.5 trillion US dollars, in 2020, 50% higher than the World Bank and IMF estimates. What is most incredible about this is that the claim is being made by prominent Chinese economists at a prominent Chinese forum, showing just how serious and mainstream the issue of local fiscal stress is becoming, even in the current sensitive political environment. Li makes four salient points in his presentation of the survey. First, quote, our analysis revealed that in 2020, China's local government debt approached 90 trillion yuan, equal to 88% of GDP at that time. This estimate significantly surpasses those commonly cited by most scholars. For instance, the IMF or the World Bank typically estimate it around 60 trillion yuan, or roughly 50% of GDP. End quote. Second, the rapid accumulation of infrastructure debt is the main reason for the rapid rise in the leverage ratio of local governments and the entire real economy. This is something that many international commentators have argued for years, but has remained a contrarian point of view within China itself. Third, perhaps most provocatively, Li argues, quote, without central government intervention, local debt is unsustainable, end quote. This is a strong criticism of China's traditional growth model, which many now argue has become obsolete and which Beijing has to transform. Li explains that China's local government debt demonstrates a nested structure, where local governments establish entities to secure loans, and these entities, in turn, leverage those borrowed funds to acquire further financing for their subsidiaries. Fourth, the fundamental reason for the surge in local debt is, quote, the prioritization of GDP growth by local governments with a particular emphasis on short-term GDP gains, end quote. Like the second point, this has long been argued by many international commentators, but Chinese economists themselves were less inclined to take this position, or less inclined to take this position so publicly. Infrastructure spending was not to accommodate the growth needs of the economy, but rather to generate short-term economic activity. This new research from the Tsinghua professors has caused a stir with China finance and economics experts, who believe that this thinking may finally be seeping into policy-making considerations in Beijing. Quote, I long argued that because this was the year in which it became formally clear that local government debt was unsustainable, this was also the year that a consensus would begin to develop on the adverse impact of excessive spending on infrastructure. We have more to go before these views are consensus among policymakers, but I think it is becoming hard to find a Chinese economist who doesn't recognize the relationship between unsustainable debt, unrecognized losses, and infrastructure spending. End quote. So, as we move into 2024, we have the dual crises of the housing sector and local fiscal stress. Policymakers are painfully aware of these, and we will see next year whether there will be the political will to do what needs to be done to make the painful changes necessary to begin to resolve them. It's going to be a very bumpy year ahead. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. My apologies once again for the background noise here in this hotel. A very Merry Christmas to those who celebrate it. Happy Holidays. Have a great weekend, and I will see you all on Tuesday.